Welcome to the Bird Show. It's going to be a great one today. It's Wednesday, 1 o'clock here in the East. If you're watching the replay, I don't know what day it is, but I appreciate you checking out the replay. We've got a couple of folks in the live stream here already. Let me say hello to Canessio Valley Cichlids. Number one in the chat. Sincere appreciation to you, sir, and congratulations. Uh, we also have Jackie's Fallen for You. Hi. One of my favorite new YouTube channels, Jackie's Fallen for You. If you enjoy entertaining, fun, ukulele music, stream music, guitar music, be sure and check out that website. And thank you for being here, Jackie. You're welcome. Listen, we're going to talk about it today. It's easy bird watching. That's what we're all about. And I get asked so many times, how do you how do you feed birds? And there are lots of intuitive answers, but when you adopt that idea as a responsibility, you want to make sure you're doing it right. You don't want to do it wrong. You don't want to do it and no birds show up. It's like having a party and, you know, no one shows up. It can make you feel bad. And that's not what bird watching is about. It's about the mood elevation. It makes your life better. We prove it over and over again here on the Bird Garden channel. Give me one minute of your time and I'll make your life better. Uh, never had that disproven. I, I'm going to go with, I'm going to say it's a true statement. Here's what I recommend you do. If you doubt, go into the extensive library of bird garden videos and find four of the short videos, 15 seconds, four 15 second videos. Watch four 15 second videos. Give me one minute of your time and see if you don't feel better than you did the minute before you started watching those videos. And I appreciate it when you watch those videos. And it's it's really it, it's really my offering to the community. This is what I can do. It's what I offer the community. Get in there. Make your life better. Glad to do it. Barb D dropping in from the UK. Great to have you here, Barb D. And uh, man, you got some really cool birds over there on the other side of the pond. I've, I've been to a few countries in Europe and uh, really appreciated the bird diversity. And you guys in the UK have been bird watching longer than we have. So thanks for all of your input into the sport, the hobby, uh, and the idea. And probably it was your writings that, that came over as we settled the United States as uh, ungrateful immigrants. Is that what you call us? I don't know. The, the birds uh, were, were worthy of watching. You guys kept great documents. We continue that. I'm a bird bander. So I capture, put a, a ring or a band on a bird's leg, take some measurements, document the measurements, submit that data to scientific databases to further the study of ornithology or the study of birds. And I enjoy that. Um, getting to study a bird in the hand is a real, it's truly a privilege. And in doing so, I'm able to have some really fantastic photography. Check out some of the videos and you'll see those amazing bird close-ups. Well, that's how I'm holding a federal permit for banding birds, which, which is required. And, um, and yeah, so I, I love doing it. And I think there's, there's a mainstream audience and maybe the data's boring, you know, that's the crust of the pie, but the sweetness is that, that close up of natural beauty. Uh, birds are a little skittish. Maybe you've noticed, and you don't get that close of a look at them that often, even sometimes if you're trying, so to be able to do that close-up photography is kind of a, a subset of uh, good things that happen from, from bird banding. Oh, oh, hey, yeah, nothing to it, right, Barb? Uh, Jackie's Falls for You says, uh, I love my bluebirds and titmouse birds. Have seen some male painted buntings in my yard a couple of times. That was exciting. Yes, Jackie, good for you. Probably, arguably, the most beautiful North American bird is the painted bunting. And um, I believe you're from down around South Carolina. And I, the last painted bunting I saw was in Folly Beach, South Carolina. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous birds. If you guys have never seen a painted bunting, it's worth a look up. And man, you're so lucky, Jackie. I'm jealous of painted buntings. We have the outstanding red-headed woodpecker in spades. We had We've identified seven different individuals at our feeding station, which by the way, we've got a 24 seven live cam on the bird garden channel live, uh, the bird garden channel feeding station. It's just in the backyard. And we've uh, a recent video 
I captured four red-headed woodpeckers at the feeder at the same time. Stunning, striking. Do yourself a favor, check out that video. If you like it, hit that like button. That really sends a message to the algorithm. I think probably uh, even during the live stream, you can hit the like button. And certainly if you're watching on the replay, hit, hit the like button. Give the channel an algorithm boost. Share this information with people you know that might enjoy it. Anyone who wants to make their life better. You know what I'm saying? If you do that, share this link and other links of videos on the channel and your social media. We, we could attract new friends. We'll have a bigger birding community. More to talk about with more people. I love building community. And that's why here on the Bird Garden Channel, we put all of the options on the buffet. We create a buffet of options for you to choose the ones you like. And if you like it well enough, get all you want and share it. If there's something you don't like here on the Bird Garden Channel, just leave it on the buffet. Don't spit on it. Just walk on by. That's not for you, but it might be for someone else. So don't spit on it. And we'll keep putting those options out there. It's going to be a very open buffet. That's how we roll around here. New local Austin. Dropping right in. Thanks. Glad to have you here. Chevy Fish, longtime friend and supporter. I appreciate you being here. Uh, you guys are talking it up in the chat. I'm going to be checking up on you guys. And if you have a question, make sure you use the at uh, Bird Garden. Yeah, and it highlights. It highlights my name, and I'll know you're asking a question. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to be speaking to the replay viewers quite a bit because we're going to upload this live stream as video content uh, when we're finished. We're gonna go for about 60 minutes as usual. We're gonna check in on the live birding uh, feeding station. Uh, I was out there, I mean, just a second ago. I mean, it's windy out there. I mean, whipping winds, uh, which reminds me, I did some urban bird watching uh, video upcoming, stay tuned. Hit that uh, icon, hit the subscribe button, and then you can hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button, and you'll be notified when I upload that video. But it, it was very windy uh, downtown in this park where I was doing some outstanding bird watching. A couple of surprise birds showed up. And I noticed the flag at one of the buildings was, you know, it was whipping pretty good. And I recalled, I recalled from science class that you could estimate the speed of the wind by observing how the flag was flying. And so uh, I'll, I'll give it to you, and I'm going to repeat it again in that video, but it was pretty cool, and I calculated the wind at about 22 miles an hour. Um, if the pole is at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the ground, most flag poles stand straight up, right? You take the angle between the, the pole and the bottom of the flag, whatever that angle is, and divide by four, estimated wind speed. It's just that simple. And then um, if you if you Google uh, calculating wind speed by a flag, you'll find several other techniques. Just in case you're interested, you find yourself out doing some urban bird watching and the wind's blowing and there's a flag nearby, you can estimate the wind speed. So I don't have a flag in the backyard, but I do have a very heavy hand-forged garden bell that I picked up while bird watching in Southern Arizona. Uh, the name of the really cool place was Arcosante. Arcosante in Southern Arizona. And I'm gonna adjust this camera, bear with me. There we go. Okay. Um, so at Arcosante, they have a forge and they're kind of self-sustaining a community there. So uh, the bells, the bells, the Solaris bells are very popular from there. Uh, Solare was the architect and designer of Arco Sante, which is a fantastic, I think I've just decided I'm going to do a segment on Arco Sante. So I won't, I won't spoil it all right now, but maybe next week we'll, we'll touch on Arco Sante and sustainable development. I kind of like that plays into the urban birding that I did last week. And now we're talking about it and I've got a video coming up. So anyway, this heavy bell very rarely rings because um, the, the paddle and the inside of the bell is so heavy, it takes quite a, a wind to blow it. <clears throat> so when I was, I was just outside and it was ringing up a storm, as we say here in the South, 
I thought I was listening to a bell choir. Ding dong, ding dong. It's really windy out there, which was kind of cool to see that bell in action. All of that to say, birds are active at all times. Did I see any birds in the heavy wind? No. As soon as the wind subsided, birds going from A to B. It was they're smart. I'm not going to use that much energy to fight that wind. I'm going to sit right here and I'll plot my course. And when that wind dies down, I'm going to head that way. So it was like uh, a, you're familiar with traffic during commuting times. Very busy. Middle of the night, no traffic, right? Same road, same people in the area, just different times. So the uh, the bird freeway shuts down in high winds immediately, whew, like the gate opens when the wind dies down. Um, but we're talking about how to feed these birds and how to do it uh, correctly. Now, I don't want you to hear this as any dogma. This is how I've done it for decades, how I've evolved as a, a bird feeder. This is where I'm at right now. And I can tell you where I am uh, physically in the Appalachian Highlands, this works. I think it will work for you. Give it a whirl. Let me know if it does, and I'll apologize to you. Come up with some more recommendations, but I think it will work. Now, a couple of things that you want to be aware of before you feed the birds. Uh, let's let's define feeding the birds. That's you providing a food source that birds will come and eat. Okay, that that's what we're talking about. Uh, you've seen people do it from a park bench, throwing kernels of corn to pigeons. You've seen the 24-7 live stream right here on the Bird Garden channel. You may have a bird feeder at your house. Typically, what's associated with you providing the birds with the food source is visual contact. We humans do this so we can watch the birds. So I generally think it's an assumed comment that when we're feeding the birds, it's for bird watching purposes. I'll say that because I fully understand the birds can take care of themselves. The birds that I feed are not captive. They're completely wild. They can eat whatever they want, and they do. And I'm just providing them a place that they can come and get food if they want to. So that I can watch them. Okay? If you're still with me, we're agreeing that Feeding birds is providing a food source to birds so they'll come and eat them and we can see them. That's what we're talking about. If, if you thought we were going to talk about anything else, this might not be the live stream for you. But go ahead and call four or five people that might be interested in this topic and, and get them in here. We've got room. There's nine of us here. Thank you all for being here. And I appreciate all the comments uh, in the chat. So once we've decided that we want to provide the birds a food source. We want them to come and eat the food so that we can see them. Um, we, want to, we want to do it responsibly. We want to take a few things into consideration. Now, as a bird bander, um, the safety of the bird is of primary concern, period. If the bird at any time during the banding process is distressed, the bird's released, whether or not it has a band on it, whether or not you've taken any measurements, the bird's safety is paramount, period. Now, the same could be said of feeding the birds. You don't want to feed them any food that has the potential of becoming poisoned. If you put food out in an open container and then overspray with herbicides or insecticides, not a good idea. Not a good idea. If you put food out that will spoil, or, or um, attract mold, not, not a good idea. So, so keep the bird safety in mind. This is just a general, this is a general common sense idea. Now, if you buy the over-the-counter bird seed, you put it in a safe area, I mean, you're 90% you're there, right? Nothing to stress over, just things to be aware of, that's all. See, there's some ideas out there on the buffet of options. Now, when I first started feeding birds, and I did this for a long time, I want to say 20 years, big box store, big bag of black oil sunflower seeds, different types of feeders, platform, hopper, 
uh, tube. Um, then I discovered uh, that the beautiful American goldfinch that we have uh, here in the east, man, things gorgeous in breeding plume, which I've got them out there now. We'll probably see some. And they're kind of, uh, they're transitional. They're still very dull. They haven't got their spring plumage grown in yet. But they like a thistle seed, much smaller seed, easier for their little finch beak to eat than the large sunflower seed. Although they'll tackle a sunflower seed every now and then. I found that the thistle seed is preferred. So I would get sock feeders and tube feeders to supplement with my black oil sunflower. And that was it. That was my feeding regime. And it was absolutely fine. It was perfect. So in doing this for a number of years, here's a couple of tips that I picked up that you might benefit from employing in your, your feeding experiment. I like to have the feeders close to a window for two reasons. First of all, we've already talked about that visual contact. But next, what researchers have determined, now this is, this is common sense, but they did a study, so now we can say there's data. If a bird feeder is within three feet of a window, it drastically reduces uh, the occurrence of mortal window strikes by the bird. So the bird's going to slow down at the feeder, leave the feeder, even if startled. And even if it flies into the window, not enough uh, speed generally to, to kill the bird if it flies into the window, just a deflection. So within three feet of a window is recommended. Now, what we've done here, and you may have heard me say this, I'm about, my bird feeder is probably 15 feet from the patio. And the patio is screened in. So if a screen is an option, that's pretty good for the birds. Not only does it reduce the reflection that confuses the bird, it thinks it can fly into the reflection not knowing there's glass there. But also, if there's a bird strike uh, into a screen, it's more of a trampoline, you know, a vertical trampoline bounce off, not a, not a fatality. So that's, that's what we're doing out there to, uh, to avoid window strikes. The windows are screened in. Um, so a screen, within three feet, a screen or window markings. Okay, if you can't get within three feet of the window, window markings such as linear tape or tape going across, not clear tape, of course, but a masking tape, painter's tape. And also now very common are decorative decals. And um, just, just, you know, around the people have lots of recommendations depending on the product you choose um, that will discourage the birds. Like if you're going to use linear tape, have the tape, less than five inches apart. If it's five inches, some small birds might see the reflection, think it's fence posts, and they're used to flying through fences all day. So closer than five inches will prevent the bird from trying to fly through uh, the strips of tape. Stickers, depending on the brand you buy, will have different recommendations. But you see how that would help a bird. Oh, that it's not only a reflection. There's something on that glass that's not reflecting. Now, why, why do we just spend a couple minutes on window strikes? Guess what the number one killer of birds is in the urban environment and in the rural environment and even undeveloped environments that have windows, window strikes. Windows kill birds. Fortunately, companies are now making um, let's call it skyscraper glass. You've seen the tall multi-story buildings, mirrored glass, that during migration, <laughs> you just find that certain buildings and certain fly zones, it's just a pile of birds. The birds crash and die right there. But now um, companies are making uh, glass that's bird friendly and the birds don't see the reflection they think they can fly through when they see the glass and the human vision isn't impeded. So, so the glass is out there. It's being used more every day, not fast enough for us, right? But eventually we'll get that glass replaced. What we can do, we can do our part. If we're going to attract the birds, we can make the birds safe in our feeding station in that way. So um, 
window placement is a consideration with the visual contact being the primary driving force there. Um, also, number two killer of wild birds. Uh, this is this, we have to tiptoe here. Pardon me in advance for tiptoeing. And some of you already know what I'm going to say. It's it's facts, so we're, we'll just we'll just say it. Um, the number two killer of wild birds, especially in neighborhoods, are are cats. Outdoor cats, uh, feral populations, cats. They're just doing the cat thing. It's what they do. They're predators. The birds are prey. Uh, and they're good at it. If you've ever had an outdoor cat for long, there may have been some time when the cat brought you a dead bird and just dropped it at your feet. Cats don't eat the birds, not a source of nourishment. It's more of a sport kill and a look what I did for you. Uh, here's your reward. Where's mine? So they're, they're just doing what cats do. If you have an outdoor cat, there are some things you can do. Um, Bells were recommended for a while, although they were found not to be so effective. Um, what happens are the, the cats have been such smart predators. They just, they hide and they're able to relax in a launch position. And then when they gear up for the launch, they don't have to move enough to attract the attention of a bird. And then the bell rings as the cat pounces and it's not enough reaction time for the bird. So the bells have turned out not to be fantastic. The latest and greatest that I've been able to find if you have an outdoor cat is to use a, a brightly colored and oversized collar. So people are having fun with this. Um, I've seen some farms that are making little cat collars and they stick out and they're having fun with the design and they can do themes for their cat. But those big collars, uh, any any movement of the cat coming or going, even if it's if it's otherwise cryptic and blending in to the uh, the habitat, those those bright collars kind of tee off the birds, especially if they include warning colors to birds. You know, white, red, yellow. Hey, what's going on over there? Moving in the bushes with all of that yellow on it. So there's consideration. And uh, to go further, since the cats are, are predators and they're very smart, uh, the other idea is to uh, not have a feeder so close to a shrub or a tree that a predator can ambush them while they're at the feeding station, while they're being distracted by the food that you're providing artificially for the nourishment of the bird. You don't want it in a position where it can be ambushed. So um, now, now that can be in conflict if you're setting up a bird feeding station at your house and you want it within three feet of a window. Well, under the window on the exterior of your house is a great place for a shrub, right? So there could be a little conflict there. So um a a recommendation there's no judgment if you don't accept this recommendation if you have a better idea fantastic put it on our buffet of options but an idea you'll see this one repeated in the, the different sources if you shop around google set up your bird feeding station uh with a 10 foot clearance okay no house no windows no trees no shrubs 10 feet Give uh, do yourself a favor and see if you can find a, a 10 foot clear, clear space to set your feeder up in. Then mark your windows at that distance. If a bird is startled and just flies into that reflection, could be bad. So then you need to go back to marking your windows to keep the uh, window strike down. Now you've got a 10 foot clear space. So the bird's not going to be ambushed by predators can keep its wits about it. You've got your windows marked, not going to fly into the window. So basically then, um, the thing you don't have control over is the predatory bird, the Cooper's hawk here in the East. Oh man, that thing, 
it flies around bird feeding stations and just looks for a little bird to eat. And that's the last thing you want. You want to feed and nourish and love the little bird. You don't want, you don't want the big bird to come down and eat it while you're feeding it. So, so the thing to do there is just to keep it clear and leave it out in the open sunlight um, so that the birds have, uh, they can see the sky where the big bird's going to come from. It's usually not going to come from under it. It's going to come over. So some of the big shelter type feeders, which are really cool, gives the bird shade. They really like it. Man, those big birds, they swoop down and then they turn their talons sideways. And as that bird comes out, they grab it. Um, and, and hey, the tooth and nail of nature, right? I get it. I'm not against the Cooper's hawk. I just don't want to feed the Cooper's hawk. They do well enough. They do well enough. They've been around for a long time. They can pick a bird off of a tree. Um, and that's fair game, fair play. I just don't want them doing that in my backyard. Could it happen? Sure. Sure. Um, I've had feeders where that has happened and it has happened on the hopper type feeder, a frame, uh, plastic panels, feed in the middle, and then uh, little perches on either side. The birds can eat out of either side. So they have a blind side. Yeah, so I have had that happen where the Cooper's hawk just came in completely uh, invisible to the bird feeding on the other side of the hopper feeder, right around the side, grab it. So it can happen. It can happen. Now, what's happening right now at the 24-7 uh, live feeding station here at the bird garden? Let me see if I can share that with you. We'll just take a peek, and I'll talk about some of the um, the feeding techniques that are going on. Do I have that? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Let's make that a little bigger. Okay. So now you see there, we've got an, oh, it's a white crown sparrow winter migrant. I love that bird. Two house finches, male and female on the three bowl feeder. What you see there, you've got those little rain caps on the feeders. There's a second adult white crown sparrow. Something flew in above. I don't know what that was. <clears throat> but those little rain caps just keep the food dry. They don't obstruct a lot of the vision. The pillar feeder is rather narrow. And there are multiple birds. That's a juvenile white crown sparrow in the feeding tray. Now we have uh, two pair of house finches on the left. So, uh, and you see birds back in the background on the fence. Lots of bird activity. Now, birds are really good at giving an alarm call. And even if birds speak a different language, they have different calls, they recognize each other's alarm calls. So what's going on out here um, at the bird garden 24-7 live bird feeding station as the eastern bluebird drops in? Look at that female. Oh, my goodness. We had uh, six clutches in the yard last year. It was fantastic. Love those guys. There's a video on the bird garden channel of a juvenile uh, Eastern bluebird fledging. We got it, just stuck its head out and flew for the first time. I captured it on video, put it in slow motion. So this is pretty open, okay? And what happens is if one of those birds, and there's a Cooper's hawk that hangs around, you see those woods back there. Don't think there's no Cooper's hawk around here. There is two or three videos feature the Cooper's Hawk. If you want to go check it out. Hey, one video, the Cooper's Hawk was just marching on the ground under the feeder, just like he was looking around, plotting, plotting uh, the way he was going to operate around this feeding station. I captured it on video. Go check it out. That's a Carolina Wren looking around there on the tray feeder, bottom right. So once one of these birds gives an alar alarm call or an alert, then the other birds they take notice and they get out of there and there'll be, there'll be stretches of time during the day where there are no birds at the feeder. None, no explanation. You can look out there, no cats, no noises, no airplanes, no neighbors, just the birds are gone. And then they'll all come back. So one day I was watching the bird feeding station and there was a downy woodpecker on one of the feeders and it just froze. Wasn't eating. Wasn't looking around, wasn't moving. 
Okay. Oh, male northern cardinal. That guy's so pretty. I love those red birds. So then, um, you know, makes you wonder, is this bird okay? Is it sick? Is it in shock? I went to the garage and looked out the, the door window and saw Cooper's hawk just outside the fence on the right side. And I was able to film it. And then I, I spliced the film of the hawk in the tree and the woodpecker frozen uh, on the feeder. Then the hawk gave up, flew away. And then the woodpecker starts eating again and all the other birds come back. It's pretty cool. So that's what happens. if Oh, Northern Mockingbird, state bird of Tennessee. And that guy's kind of a bully at the feeder. I don't know why. Uh, the bluebirds certainly don't mess with him anymore. And that's typically a protein feeder. He's not eating any seed, but we've got suet. Uh, the suet balls on the left are insect infused. And there's also some freeze-dried mealworms in that clear tray the mockingbird was eating from. So those are basically the physical characteristics of how we're feeding birds here and a couple of reasons why, a couple of anecdotes as the northern mockingbird returns. Suet, by the way, is beef fat. Um, and you can then infuse fruit, seeds, whatever you want. And lots of birds, especially in the wintertime, appreciate suet. Uh, woodpeckers eat it year round. Um, that mockingbird typically eats insects. But um, the suet is a really good source of protein uh, or energy, I'm sorry, carbohydrates. And the mealworms are the protein. Lots of peanuts out there. It's a popular wintertime food. Um, these foods primarily are from Wild Birds Unlimited. I don't, I'm not sponsored. This isn't a paid advertisement. It's just, it's just what we use. That green cage feeder is a big box store, uh, multi-food. It's got peanuts and freeze-dried mealworms and seed, uh, but it's it's hullless seed. If you look at the coloration there, none of those foods have the holes. I uh, used to feed the black oil sunflower seeds, which, you know, were a black shell on the sunflower. But now we've gone away from that. It's quite a bit more expensive, but there is no accumulation of the seed hulls because there's no seed hulls. So there's no in, uh, bacteria, mold, uh, rodent attractants because we're using the hullless seeds. So the seed in the three bowl feeder, that's topped off heaping every morning. You can... You can run the timeline back on the live stream here and see at about 7.30 in the morning, those three bowl feeders are heaping with loose seed, okay? And a lot of birds would rather get the loose seed than have to pick it from the, the dried gelatin or out of the suet, like you see in some of the other foods. Now, I use sunflower seeds and uh, thistle seeds for years and years. Birds love it. As we developed um, our bird feeding station, and I wanted to begin to attract uh, a greater diversity of birds, this is where we are now. No holes, some energy foods, some seed foods, some seasonal foods, some that we're feeding now. It's still winter time here, even though it's really pretty out there. And if I move my screen, I can maybe see... It's 62 degrees. That's going to call, oh man, I'm going to have to have a cigar after this live stream because it's been a while. And man, 62 is really warm for this time of year. Um, Jackie's fallen for you. Uh, I, I do have some suet recipes, but to be honest with you, Jackie, it is such a mess to make that suet. You can buy the square uh, cakes at the uh, big box store for a buck. I'm really, I'm just paying the consumer tax and, and buying the ready-made stuff these days. But if, if you want to make your own, that's a good Google search. There are lots of good recipes out there. I recommend you um, you choose one from a reputable bird-watching uh, company. Uh, not, not all suet is created equal. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. And you decide. Let us know if you find a good one. Nola's Dolls and Aquatics are here. Uh, bluebirds are mean. I, they're territorial. Now they're they're not necessarily mean. Uh, they're I want to believe they're very sweet, like all of the birds. But they are territorial. You get in their territory, they can let you know about it. 
and if you're a bird and you get in their territory, they will really let you know about it. There's lots of, uh, I put a, a camera, a motion activated camera on a nest box and I've got, uh, I've got a full length video or two or three and several shorts on that Eastern bluebird in breeding plumage in full sunlight. <laughs> it's a stunner. It's amazing. Check out some of those bluebird videos. But back, back to feeding, 12 of you here in the live stream. Thank you so much for being here. And I do appreciate all of the participation in the chat. We're going to leave this live stream up afterwards as, uh, as content for uh, the purpose of people watching the replay who want this information. If you've learned anything during today's live stream, please leave a comment uh, after the video uploads. Go, go to the replay and leave a comment. If you've got a question, that's a great place to drop a question. I read those questions. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Skipper's Aquarium uh, in the house received a bird garden package today. Well, uh, that was a good day for you, sir. And uh, you opened that thing up and all the contents were river life uh, art and bird garden art. And you're welcome to use that. Uh, in a fundraiser that we discussed the, to any, any way you choose skipper glad glad to let you have that and i appreciate what you're doing for the community so uh yes we're we're talking about how to feed birds what i've done is i've taken a series of hangers there's a pole and there's hangers and i've hung some bird uh, bird feeders right you can see them kind of moving in the wind there in front of the pole I installed a feeding tray. Now these trays are sold mostly to catch food as they fall out of hopper feeders and that type of thing. I use it as an independent feeder. Um, I put peanuts in loose uh, because it resembles the ground. Basically, I've taken a chunk of ground and raised the ground up. So now the sparrows and the doves and other typical ground feeders are on camera. So you can see them. And I can see them. That's the purpose of that tray. So it's actually two poles. That tray is on a pole by itself. And then directly behind it and against it is the taller pole that I'm using to suspend the other feeders. Jackie's fallen for you says she thinks it would be fun for the kids to make suet. I would say that's an understatement. <laughs> I would say the kids would love to make some suet. That's great. Canessio Valley Cichlid says a rat cross piece of art for the auction. Yes, or two or three, Canessio. You should tune in. Uh, I will say this. For those of you who collect my art, thank you very much, especially if you've bid on an auction here in the Bird, the bird Talk show. Um, that goes directly to pay for these bird feeders and the services required to bring a 24 seven live feeding station. It's very much appreciated. Uh, and I do enjoy making that available to you uh, as an option. Perhaps we'll do that again in the future. It was, it became a bit overwhelming. Uh, so many issues were coming up with this sideline thing over here of auctioning a piece of art that it was distracting from the show. So maybe, maybe we'll get back to that. I've got a few pieces of art over here on the show. What we do is I sell pieces of, desktop art, right? Small pieces of art you can display on your desk that uh, make your life better anywhere you want to put them. Here's a piece. Um, and it's all kinds of, of art, modern, abstract. This piece is called Amphibious. It's a five by seven canvas, canvas board. So it's archival. If you take care of it, it's not going anywhere. And I throw in a free easel. Once we reach a certain level in the auction, I throw in a free easel. And uh, compared to the retail, uh, what I sell these for retail, usually, depending on the auction, but usually it's a bargain. You get a bargain in the auction. Yeah. And I, I mean, just the bright colors, it makes me happy. I don't know. This particular piece, while I'm holding it up here, I'll tell you, is sparnished. Sparnished is a word I made up. It means it's lightly varnished or sparsely varnished. It's not a heavy coat of varnish, just enough to fix the medium. 
amphibious. So that's how I help pay, how you know, offset expenses of selling art here, which I love to do. And I very much appreciate you collectors out there. And I do hope that the art I've donated to this uh, charitable cause um, works in, in every way good that we imagine that it would. Um, Jackie following for you says, have you discussed how to clean feeders and how often it needs to be done? No, I haven't. That's actually another entire video, but it's an excellent question. We need to touch on it. Let's skip over the physical plant here for a minute. Go to maintenance. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Um, the recommendation is to clean your feeders uh, every two weeks. All right. Every two weeks, give them a, a warm, soapy brushing off. Now, if you look at these feeders, heavily used, you can see, um, you can see evidence that birds have been there. Now, if you look at that feeder on the right, that's a pillar feeder, okay? there's You can see everything about that feeder. There's a hanger. There's a little cap that keeps the rain off of it. There's the pillar of food, and you can see the metal stalk going up through the center of that. And that uh, center stalk is welded to the spiraling wire that wraps around becomes a perch in the bottom. Uh, and that's it. That, that's it. And so everything else is bird food. So there's a place for the bird's feet, place for the bird to hang on to the food and eat, place for the bird to stay dry if it wants to. But that's it. Yeah, so a quick dip, uh, stiff brush, warm, soapy water, boom. Okay, that's a very general idea. Very general. If you want to do it once a week, fantastic. If you don't make it every two weeks, keep an eye on it. You don't want to be spreading bird disease. Speaking of, a couple of these finches, those house finches and occasional American goldfinch, they can um, get a conjunctivitis type uh, disease that's really easy to see. You notice, oh, there's this crusty stuff on the eyes. What is that? So then you need to clean more often and you need to suspend feeding. You don't want the birds coming to a common area. I mean, boy, aren't we trained these days about taking care of of ourselves. Same for the bird. Just take the feeders down for a couple of weeks. Put up one feeder. See which birds come back. After you notice that, take the feeders down, clean with a light, mild, very light bleach solution. Okay. Again, fact check me on this. Don't, don't let this be your only source of information. This is just one guy talking away on the internet. But a mild bleach solution will take care of um, bird disease that you happen to notice. Bird acts funny, bird looks funny. Take the feeders down, use a mild bleach solution. Otherwise, general maintenance, uh, every two weeks, warm soapy water. Annually, annual, I'm a big believer, annually, whether they need it or not, right? <laughs> annually, uh, bleach solution wash. Every piece, every piece. If they have... Uh, these are metal, okay? You look, all, all you see out there is metal. The green wire cage is rubber coated. The plastic feeder in the middle, that clear piece, plastic. Keep an eye, speaking of maintenance, keep an eye on all of these pieces. If they rust, if they break, if they bend, make sure that when you install them, they're bird safe. Remember, it's about the safety of the birds. That's why you do the maintenance for the safety of the birds. Make sure the bird's not going to get cut or caught, not going to get a foot hung in a loose piece of wire. So it's just flopping around, attracting a Cooper's hawk. That's not fair to the birds. You don't want that happening at your bird station. So when you do find, uh, when you do find damaged or worn equipment, make certain that you've repaired it properly. So the bird's not going to be injured by it, or you just go ahead and replace it. I used to use a lot of wooden feeders. And I noticed even at the annual maintenance, being exposed to the elements all year and then getting a, 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 a once a year bleach bath, man, it took its toll on those wooden feeders. And as they would begin to splinter and weaken, I'd just take them out of service. I mean, I guess you could do a heavy sanding and get rid of all of the, the splinters and do a close inspection, maybe get another year out of them. 
then I would just replace them. And typically, uh, just thinking off the top of my head, I don't recall a wooden feeder that did not last five years. And now the uh, Wild Birds Unlimited similar feeders to what I was using years ago are uh, made of the same material as the border of that feeding tray that you see, the gray portion of the feeding tray. And it's a it's an eco-recycled uh, plastic product, 100% recycled material. And man, I can't tell. It, the, it holds a screw just like wood, I'll tell you that. There's been no warping, cleans up easy. It's like anti microbial so that, that that's the material to go with if you have the option um, I, I would say it's an upgrade be prepared but there you go general maintenance good idea if you're going to feed the birds provide the general maintenance uh the quality of food I, I i've never been dissatisfied with any food that i bought either at the big box store or from the the wild birds unlimited i suppose you could I suppose it's possible. I think um, if ever I had a suspicion that food was bad for whatever reason, it's, well, mold, if you see mold, just, it's a no-go. I've never found it in a, in a purchase bag of food. So don't, don't use molded food. And then I use a very high-end food. And that bird's being very still. I'm keeping my eye on it. Not feeding. See, that bird has come to a feeder. And now it's not feeding. Okay, that's a question mark. Let's keep an eye on that guy. No, this is not the time of day Cooper's Hawk usually feed. They usually feed in the, the dusk and the twilight. Okay, back to eating. Or maybe he heard something. Maybe the birds were chattering. He wanted to make sure what they were talking about. But this is high quality food. Um, Three-fourths of the hanging feeder have heat-infused, pepper-infused food. That's a terrific deterrent to mammals, so much so that I haven't had a squirrel at my feeder uh, in a year and a half. The squirrels came, they ate, I changed to the heat-infused food. They came in the fall when I changed. They came in the winter, uh, and they didn't come back in the spring. It's like the local squirrels, I don't know if they have a squirrel union and they talk about it. Don't go over there, man. That guy's feeding hot stuff. It's no good. But uh, the, the deer mouse came one night, didn't like it, didn't come back. The raccoons and possums stopped coming at night. The bear that absconded, watch the bear video. Just go find the bear video and watch it. Just tore the pole down, left, took the feeder but left all the suet balls. The suet balls were all in the yard because they were too hot for it to eat, but it took the feeder. Now I take the feeders in at night in the springtime because definitely that was an expensive bear visit. Cool video, but I don't want a bear in my yard. It was 10 p.m. You can look at the clock uh, in the lower right and see that when the bear came, it was 10 p.m. and I was 15 feet away in my living room watching TV. I don't want that thing. Adkins Nature Aquarium shows up. We start talking about art. Here comes Adkins Nature Aquariums. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Glad you could stop in for a bit on your lunch break. So we're talking about high-end food. No holes. Heat infused. Um, you can buy it. Uh, try it. Um, if, it if, it's, um, if you're not running a 24-7... Uh, feeding station that you want to keep in, in in good repair, you know, for the internet. You probably don't need to run all of that heat infused food all the time, but you can try it. You'll notice you, you're gonna you're gonna be like, wow, I don't know about this price on this heat infused food compared to the non heat infused food. It is does require humans, you know, to to go through several more steps to make the food, even if it's a pillar feeder with or without the heat infused um, stuff. It's really infused. It's not an outside coating. Every seed has heat on it. But anyway, give it a try. If you've got squirrel problems, you don't want to, you don't want squirrels eating your bird food, give it a try. And uh, maybe the, the squirrels will learn as my have. I'm not even going down there. I'm not. Now, what I mentioned on several of these bird talk shows, thank you for being here. 10 of you here now. We've been going for 51 minutes. We're going to close out the hour and that'll be it for today. Uh, just to the left off screen, 
of the bird feeding station is a 5,000 gallon koi pond with a 26 foot waterfall. The birds enjoy so much bathing uh, in that waterfall. It's amazing. The water splashes up and they take a shower over there on the edge. They jump in the shallow and just splash all around. And they also drink from all over the pond, from the main basin, uh, the top of the waterfall, in the waterfall. And the mammals do the same thing. After they get a mouthful of that hot pepper, it's probably cayenne. It's not ghost pepper or anything like that, but I think it's cayenne pepper. Um, I mean, if you just, um, you, you may love spicy food, but if you just imagine coating a French fry in cayenne pepper, you're going to notice the heat. It may not be too hot for you, but you're going to notice the heat. Well, that, that's what's happened to the squirrels, and they'll run over to the pond and get a drink. And uh, I don't know exactly how long their learning curve was, but they'd jump back in the feeder, and then they would be angry, and they'd smack their front paws down, like, don't be hot this time. I'm tired of you being hot. And they take another bite, and they run back over to the pond. But after a couple of days, uh, a couple of visits, I think, from each squirrel, that was it. And then the new squirrels would come by and say, I'm not afraid of any heat. Let me get a bite of that. And it was like, well, okay, so you're right. I don't want any of that either. And now, no squirrels. Knock on wood, no bears. No raccoons, no possums. That's the way I want it. Hey, Maybe, and, and I have a certified backyard habitat, right? I'm not using a lot of herbicides and stuff. So if you want to attract mammals, hey, attract mammals. I want to feed birds, and I've learned how not to attract mammals. So that's the way I do it. Again, this is one opinion. You, you do it the way that brings you the most happiness. This makes me so happy. And that wind has turned that um, that square feeder sideways. And now you can see that it's about a, a two and a half inch thick block of food. It still it doesn't weigh much. It's very light. It's very airy. Uh, and the peanuts and the freeze-dried mealworms are real attractant to the woodpeckers. And, you know, I haven't. Let me. I'm going to go the 24-7 live stream. Uh All's well at 4 a.m. I'm scrolling through the timeline. Okay, I am up to daylight at 7 o'clock. Yeah, the feeders are heaping full at 6.58. Let's see. Typically, early in the morning, we have a rush of woodpeckers. Did we have any woodpeckers this morning? Did anybody check in on the feeders this morning? The doves came in. Morning doves, oh, plenty. The mockingbirds and the titmice, chickadees. It's so windy out there. That's why we don't see a lot of small birds right now. There's not a lot of small bird activity. Blue jays were in this morning at 9 o'clock. It's eating an enormous amount of peanuts. It's amazing. If you want to go back to the 902 mark, you'll see the plumage of the blue jays blowing all over the place as they gorge themselves with peanuts. Yeah, well, it's been windy all day. So even at nine o'clock, the, the feeders are just swinging. You can imagine that's not good for bird business. <laughs> They're just not interested in uh, taking a carnival ride while they eat. If they, have, if they get hungry enough, they'll be there. Oh, you got to see that with me. I didn't realize. Okay, well, let me go back to live then. All right. Very good. Glad to have you aboard. Okay, isn't that funny? Now we're live and we've got the same swinging motion. All right. Well, I didn't see any questions pop up over here in the chat. I'm going to monitor the comments after this video uploads. I do appreciate everyone coming. We're at the 55 minute mark, 12 people here today, and hope to see many of you uh, in the comments and the replay. Always a treat to answer questions from you guys. And today we talked about how to feed birds. And I gave you my idea. I told you to, to research some of your own, a Google search of how to feed birds. You're going to be busy for as long as you want to be busy. If you want to know more about how I do it, leave a question. Uh, this is, I'm at the peak. I'm running full throttle right now. Uh, this, this technique is one that I've developed. 
I've evolved into over decades of feeding birds. So I can recommend it. It's very successful. It's not cheap, but the Wild Birds Unlimited system seem to be very effective. Again, unsponsored, unpaid, just, just where, where my journey of feeding birds has taken me. This is where I am. Look around. If you like it, I'll help you come along. If that's what you like. If you're looking for a less expensive option, watch some of my videos. I've got one video, a 30-second bird feeder, proven. And I used a recycled material and food that I had in the cabinet. Okay, 30 seconds to make it with recycled material and food on hand. And then I show you video of the birds eating it, eating the food. So, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. Got Canesio Valley coming in with a comment here. Three minutes to go. He says, Rack, I ordered the Vortex Diamondback HD 8x42 binder that one of our guests had on the show. And it comes with the, uh, the pack and a harness. Oh, my gosh. What a bundle. Way to go. Canestio, please keep us focused. Focused. <laughs> that was a, a binocular slip. Keep us updated on how you like those. And let me recommend that you document what's the first bird that you see through your new binoculars. First bird you see through your new binoculars. And probably you're going to see it with your naked eye first and then magnify it. But the first bird you see through your binoculars. Let me know what that is. I know that... Um, when I've had outstanding binoculars like those you just ordered, uh, when I upgrade or wear those out and move on to the next binocular, it's like, man, I hold that thing. I've seen a lot of birds through these binoculars. It's a real attachment. Let me reduce that. There we go. Since the birds are on a little break right now. But I hope those work out for you. I think you're going to really enjoy those. Um, yeah, first bird idea. And you're more likely to watch birds more often. Now that you've got, you know, a new tool. So I hope that you do and you enjoy that and you do keep us up to date. Let us know where you're going bird watching and what you're seeing. Because, hey, uh, in the final minutes here, migration is happening. All right. We're past mid-February. Migration has already started. We're going to see it here probably First week of March, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to start seeing migration. Right now, we're knowing, yeah, migration has started. And then by the 1st of April, it's just going to be a constant flow right here, this flyway of the neotropical migrants coming back, which means we're going to lose the white crowned sparrow, which is so cool to see. I'm glad I got to share that bird with you today. Um, but we're going to get replacements, right? We're going to get to see all of those migrants that are coming from the tropics up here to nest and raise their young. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to be on top of that. Um, and you are too, Canesio Valley cichlids with those new binoculars. 8x42 is a great size, by the way. Um, okay, uh, got an update here. They are due to arrive February 24th. This weekend is Cornell's great backyard bird count. That's right. If you don't have a backyard, if your backyard doesn't have birds, tune in virtually and count my birds. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to clean up for them. You don't have to pay for the feed. That's why the 24-7 feeding station is up. Tune in anytime. We're glad to have you. And that's going to bring us to the end of our hour today. Man, time flies. So great to see all of you here in the chat. Uh, I love seeing you guys. And if you're watching the replay, thank you so much for doing that. Don't forget to leave a comment like this. Hit the little like icon, you know, give us an algorithm boost. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you can see that urban bird watching video we've got in production right now. It's coming up soon. You're going to enjoy it. We're going to go places, man. I'm taking you there. You're going to like it. And uh, we're going to be back here next week. We're going to talk about several things that are going to involve bird watching, bird feeding, and how to get along better with nature and the benefits that it holds for us. Until then, why don't you get out there and see some birds?